On the 1st of October 1949, in the coffee shop of the National Zoo in Pretoria, South Africa, 50 passionate hunters met to form the Transvaal Hunters Association. They were concerned with the state of South Africa's wildlife and believed that something had to be done before all was lost. The wildlife resource throughout Southern Africa had been under immense pressure since the arrival of white settlers and their weaponry in the Cape in 1652. All forms of wildlife products were in demand, from meat and skins to ivory, feathers and rhino horn. The continent had a seemingly endless supply of wildlife, there for the taking. Over the years, recreational and commercial hunting took its toll on game numbers in the absence of any controls. As agriculture expanded, Farmers viewed wildlife as a crop raiding threat and as competition for livestock grazing, pests that had to be eliminated. The rinderpest virus that swept down from North Africa in the 1890s killed an estimated 5.2 million cattle south of the Zambezi River, along with sheep and goats and wildlife species. The general belief was that wildlife contributed to the spread of the disease it was open season across all species. During the Anglo-Boer War, English General Kitchener's scorched earth policy saw the erection of tens of thousands of kilometers of barbed wire fences and 8,000 blockhouses manned by 56,000 soldiers. This tactic not only perpetrated unimaginable misery amongst the civilian population, but also blocked wildlife migration routes. Thousands of game animals were slaughtered during the war to feed both armies and the starving civilians. The tsetse fly carries the parasite Trypanosoma brocii, which causes sleeping sickness in humans and nagana in livestock. The fly was associated with wildlife, and in Zululand, the authorities launched Operation Game Extermination in 1916. By the end of the operation in 1929, over 138,000 animals had been killed. During the two world wars and the intervening economic depression, a hungry populace depleted the country's wildlife populations even further. By the time of the formation of the Transvaal Hunters Association, the future for South Africa's wildlife looked bleak. Game animals were worthless to landowners as they were res nullius, belonging to no one. The association wanted to ensure that only like-minded individuals joined, people who were committed to reviving wildlife populations across the country through advocacy and hands-on involvement. Applications had to be endorsed by the police to assert the applicant's integrity. The entry fee was set at two pounds and the annual membership three pounds. The organization became affiliated with the Wildlife Protection Society and in 1954, its name changed to the Transvaal Hunters and Game Preservation Association, which ultimately evolved into the South African Hunters and Game Conservation Association, or SA Hunters in short. During the 1960s, the heads of regional wildlife agencies began meeting annually to improve the sector's prospects across the sub-region. They agreed that the laws be changed and landowners could utilize wildlife commercially with far fewer state-imposed restrictions. In South Africa, landowners who enclosed their properties with game-proof fencing could own the wildlife. It now had value. In 1960, there were only three private game ranches in the country. Today, over 10,000 cover more than 20 million hectares. This revolutionary policy change dramatically transformed the conservation landscape. South Africa soon became a popular destination for foreign safari hunters. While this suited the landowner, it pushed up prices, making it expensive for local meat hunters. During the 1970s, more hunting organizations started to emerge. 
SA Hunters realized that close cooperation between the various role players was essential to protect the interests of the local hunter. In 1984, Nikor van Royen, a taxidermist, was elected president of SA Hunters. He served as president until 1991 and then again in 1993 and played a considerable role in expanding the organization. Tragically, he was murdered in 1994. He bequeathed to the association one million rand, his house, 150 trophies that he had hunted and mounted himself, various artifacts and his extensive library. This legacy significantly improved the association's finances and provided permanent headquarters when his house was converted into offices. Later, as the association grew, his legacy made it possible to purchase the present headquarters at Nyati Park. The conference hall where his trophies are displayed is named after him. By 1990, the game industry had become well established and wildlife numbers across the country exploded. Foreign safari hunters were primarily interested in trophy hunting so opportunities for the local meat hunter grew as game ranchers looked to market excess non-trophy animals. Both forms of hunting were essential for the growth of the sector. Piet van der Merfe, a professor at Northwest University, specializes in wildlife tourism and nature-based tourism research. From our research that we've conducted amongst the international hunter as well as the South African hunter, your South African hunter you will see is for the experience and the excitement and obviously spiritual, they want to connect with nature, they want to sit with a campfire in the evening and listen to nature, be outdoors for a while. And then the one that comes up strongly is meat, they hunt for meat. Hunting for me has become a comprehensive activity in which the preparation is very important, the time spent in the field and the connection to the land. And I've been able to teach my children this as well in our household. We prepare all our own game meat, we process our own game birds, and we probably eat game five out of seven days in the week. We have freezer, stuff is vacuum packed and marked, and the product looks as good as anything that comes from any shop. If you're international hunter, due to the fact that they come from overseas, they also want to eat the meat, but they can't take it back. So their main mode of hunting is adventure. They want to have an adventure, African safari. Also spiritual, they want to connect with nature, want to be in nature. And then it's also sort of a challenge for them to hunt different African species. So from the research we've done, there's different motives for the hunters to come and hunt in South Africa. And, uh, and it's very important that we know these motors because uh, if we know the motors, we know how to package our products and know how to develop our product as well. The idea of forming branches within SA Hunters was initially considered in 1952, but only in March of 1993 was the first branch established in the town of Bethel. SA Hunters at branch level is an association for members by members. The management of each branch is volunteers. It's people with a passion for hunting and shooting and conservation. And those people do all the work in their free time. One of the most important projects in every branch is either to build a shooting range or to upgrade it. Now the Wilgerevier branch at Frankfurt in the Free State is an example of what can be done by a small branch. They took a very basic shooting range and they upgraded it. They've got unbelievable sponsorships from businesses and farmers in the region. One of these sponsors was the local co-op. That specific sponsorship was in the N70,000 Rand. The earth moving equipment was sponsored by one of the farmers. This is the most expensive part of a shooting range project. The shooting range is the heart of a branch. If your shooting activities are successful and attended well by your members, that's where the enthusiasm and the camaraderie start between members. <laughs> As more branches formed and the organization grew, it became evident that a full-time CEO was necessary, along with supporting staff. After his second term as president, Nick van der Merfe was appointed the first CEO in January 1998. Fred Kampfer was the president of SA Hunters from 2011 to 2014, after which he became the organization's CEO. I'm often asked what differentiates SA Hunters from other organizations. 
SA Hunters is the only association with both hunting and conservation portfolios in one entity. Because of our professional full-time managers and staff, we can run SA Hunters on business principles. An administrative system of departments supports the CEO and the association runs on well-founded corporate principles. There is a manager for finance and administration, firearm help desk, information technology, training and sport shooting, hunting affairs, conservation issues and branch and shooting matters. We've got 81 branches and they are represented in 15 regions. Each of these regions have a regional coordinator. In the Bar River region we have four branches, the Hartbeest branch, Vitre Noster, Frontier and Val Driuk. As regional uh, coordinator, uh, we uh, make contact with the branches on a regular basis. We uh, sit in on their meetings. We are also a direct and short route to the head office when there is any uh, queries or problems. We have at least two regional branch meetings with head office in the region with all the chairmans and their committees. This model has been in place now for about 12 years and it's working very well. With the advent of a new democratic South Africa in April 1994, hunters were concerned about hunting rights and gun ownership. Protecting the rights of firearm owners became a primary concern for the SA Hunters executive. The Firearms Act of 2000 required accredited hunting associations to provide training that complied with the requirements of the Skills Development Act. One of the requirements for firearm ownership is that you've got to be able as an individual to provide proof of the activities where you used your firearms. Now, if you look at the administrative system developed by SA Hunters, it creates the opportunity for me as an individual to capture those activities in a very simple and easy way. It's an in-house program which integrates all the aspects of SA Hunters and allows all our members to do self-administration. So they can change the personal details, they can print their own certificates, is it, if it is uh, membership certificates, training certificates, allows you also to capture all your hunting activities, shooting activities, training and uh, conservation activities. We all know, all of us that are firearm owners, that not easy to be a legal firearm owner nowadays. You've got to comply with a significant load of statutory requirements. The police have to issue a competent certificate for each citizen who wish to possess a firearm. That means every citizen needs to complete a proficiency training. There will also be a background check by the police and they're looking at the characteristics of each person by means of a statement from friends and family. The police will look through that and they will issue a competent certificate. Our responsibility is to help to issue the training for the members. We register as a dedicated sport shooting organization. If we look at the dedicated sport shooter course where we train members in our sport shooting activities and they can then apply for dedicated status in terms of the Firearms Control Act and may then have more than four firearms and enjoy the other benefits of the act. After each training, all the documents and administration comes to our office. We issue about 150 certificates monthly. It's a great honor to, to serve and to help our members to hopefully hand in a successful firearm license application and to keep their firearms safe. For many years we had a magazine that was made available to members. This was clearly something that could become a commercial entity. So in about 2010, we, we created a company which owns the magazine, the SA Yachter, SA Hunter. We sold 50% of the shares in the company to Media24. The work that's done to publish the magazine is done professionally under the guidance of Media24, but that ensures that SA Hunters not only have the benefit of access to the magazine, which members still see as our own magazine, but it also generates an income stream which allows us to maintain membership fees at a slightly lower level. The company also purchased the Man Magnum magazine. We now have 
two magazines in this table. One mainly an Afrikaans magazine, while the other one is mainly an English magazine. Esa Hunt has also started a firearm and hunting show. Within three years, this hunting show that we put up on site at the offices of Esa Hunt has just become too big. So we then got to a point where we got a professional event organizer. It became vested in a company commonly known as Antex. It became a commercial business and SA Hunters also then own 50% of Antex with Adrian Woutstra, who is our partner that does all the work. We have the annual Huntex exhibition over a period of four days where we have up to, I think, the biggest number of exhibitors we had present was something like 186. This has become the biggest single hunting and related products exhibition in Africa. If you want to hunt, you've got to be able to shoot and shoot fairly well. And sports shooting is the route that's used to improve shooting skills and shooting abilities, which just makes it a little easier when you're hunting. Most of the branches offer at least a shooting day every two months. In a lot of cases, there's a shooting day every month for a variety of disciplines. From hunting-based shooting exercises where you shoot basically with hunting rifles on animal type targets to different sports shooting disciplines with a variety of firearms where you can test your different shooting skills. In 2005, when, when the Rimline branch actually started, there was around about 50 members. We closed to the 800 mark at this point in time. 80% of those members are all hunters. We're the only branch in South Africa where you can stay in one place on the shooting point itself, which is covered with shade net. We got our targets that we put onto these little carts, and then the cart will go out to 300 meters. Everybody will shoot at 300 meters once you finish with the shooting, and they move it to 200 meters. Once 200 meters is finished, they bring it to 100 meters. When you're shooting, you're very comfortable. You don't have to pack up everything and walk with everything, so you can sit in one place and do your shooting. Some of the biggest scores in the last five years has been done here at Dreamland itself. The 81 branches are divided into 15 regions and every year for the first six months of the year there is um, a regional shooting competition and that's where the competition start. We end off at the uh, annual national championships at the end of the year where all these guys got an opportunity to shoot shoulder to shoulder against each other and to determine who is the uh, champions in the association in a lot of different sport shooting disciplines. <laughs> We've got sports men and women that can really compete on international level with the best in the world, which was proven at the 2019 IGRF International Gallery Rival Federation World Championships, which we hosted in Valcom, where we won the small ball team event as well as the center fire team event, and we had several individual championships. We had Jan Youngster that won three international individual world championship titles. There's been a large emphasis on getting youth involved in our activities and training programs. We get them at a young age involved in responsible firearms usage. One of our main challenges today is to get youngsters away from television sets, away from electronic stuff and back into nature. The concept of introducing hunting to youngsters started with outdoor camps being offered at elementary, intermediate and advanced levels from 1980 to 2004. It became clear that not all kids were interested in hunting, and in 2005, the focus of the camps changed to responsible outdoor education and sustainable conservation principles. The Camille Doring branch of SA Hunters has a unique ongoing outdoor education project called the Junior Rhino Rangers Program. The branch conservation coordinator, Rusty Hustler, a former head of the Northwest Province Parks Board runs the program within the Mafeking Nature Reserve. The success of the rhino populations within South Africa and possibly within the world lies with the children and we need to educate the children. So with that in mind, we started a junior rhino rangers program 
whereby the children are given the basics of the rhinos, how to identify them, how to determine what sex they are. And then with the notching system that is used throughout Southern Africa, we can identify each rhino. We give them their little booklets that they take out with them using binoculars which have been donated to us. So they can observe the, the rhinos from a distance, a safe distance, and then we take them through the notching sequence and then they can write this into their booklet and that information is then passed on to Parks Board which goes into their database. Once they've done a number of these under supervision from ourselves, we then hope that they will get their parents to take them into the park encourage the families to come and see the park. And I find that this is really encouraging and lovely well to work with them. We have to let them know of the negative results of poaching. So we do show them pictures of dead rhinos that have been poached. We do take them as well to carcasses that, that have been poached and we show it to them. It was poached. Why was it poached? For the horn. Because oh. some people will poach will kill the horn. So the guy came horn. across that way over there, over the fence, and came in and he found him here and shot him. It makes a big impact on the kids. That is very important to us. And I know it's not nice for the children to see that, but they have to be aware that if we lose the rhinos through poaching, the only place that they will see the rhinos is going to be in zoos. It is a very worthwhile program. We're hoping that the branch will be able to continue this program with more children be being involved from various other schools within the Mafeking area. In addition to the Junior Rhino Rangers project, the Kamil Doring Branches Kids Environmental Club focuses on activities such as beekeeping, worm farms, indigenous tree planting, recycling and rubbish removal from the Mafeking Game Reserve. The branch is also working with Northwest Parks to improve the infrastructure and services of the game reserve. It's becoming more and more evident that government protected areas cannot function on their own or in isolation uh, anymore. And we are reliant now on, uh, on partnerships in managing these areas. To that extent, we've entered into a memorandum of understanding with SA Hunters to collaborate in the management of um, our protected areas as one, but also on other areas as well. As a government agency, we can capitalize on the enthusiasm and skills of members of the local branches around our protected areas. From end of 2018-2019 was uh, when it was very hot. We didn't have enough uh, water for the game in the reserve. The buffalo used to break out to go to our neighboring farmers. Then the SA Hunting Association came to our rescue. The borehole was already sunk, so we equipped it with the solar panels and new pumps and within two weeks of the request the first water was pumped down to the dam and was very instrumental in saving a lot of game from dying from the drought. Since then we never have any challenges of uh, buffalo breaking out. We've also taken on the servicing and helping with maintenance on all the boreholes that supply water to all the waterholes within the park. And that is one huge headache less for us to manage in the park. They also assist us with the um, renovation of the buffalo bomas, and that would allow us now to start trading with buffaloes because they have to be quarantined before we can move them out. During the fire season, people just ignite the field. The SA Hunting Association members, they do come to assist us uh, a lot. Even if they don't have fire equipment, they just cut branches and assist us to beat the fire so that we control it. We are also reliant on, the, on, on bodies like the I like SA Hunters to help us with marketing of our own products. We put out a lot of hunting packages in, in some of our parks. Through their network, we were able to fill our hunting packages fairly quickly. We actually managed to get quite a good return. But, uh, what we started here in Mafeking, it's something that we would really like to build out into other areas as well. About two years ago, we started on the webpage a section called Branch Accomplishments. The intention with that is to give those branches that have exceptional projects some recognition and in a sense to show some of the other branches what kind of projects they are across the country. 
Because what we found, especially in the regional model, when branches start working together and they see what each other is doing, that they actually motivate each other to a level where you very soon see the success spreading across a whole region. The nine-year drought in parts of the Western and Northern Cape, one of the worst recorded in over a century, led to ecological devastation and severe hardship for people, domestic stock and wildlife. SA Hunters members from across South Africa are an active, integral part of their society and involve themselves with conservation issues and socio-economic challenges. To that extent, members from the Kamdibo and Overberg branches committed to supporting the struggling communities of Aberdeen, Sutherland and Fraserburg. I'm a farmer's wife in Sutherland. It's a small town, the coldest town in the Northern Cape in South Africa. There's an organization, SA Hunters, in South Africa. They've got branches all over the country. And in the Wifferberg region, there's a couple of people that have really taken the farmers under their wing. Overberg branch started in 2006. We've got about uh, roughly about 880 members at the moment. 90% of them are hunters. Around about 2017, two of the persons on the Overberg branches committee decided to go and visit some friends and family in the drought stricken area of Sutherland. We've been going through a terrible drought that started in 2014. Our last year, good rains was in 2013. We started feeding our sheep in June of 2014. And we haven't stopped today since then. The Karoo farmers are used to droughts and we plan for seasonal droughts. We know to put fodder away and to put finances away to sustain us during a drought. But this drought has caught us so badly because nobody could ever predict a drought that could carry on for this long. So the result is that our funds are totally depleted. Farmers have started taking out mortgages on their farms to buy fodder to keep their sheep alive. And we've gotten to a stage already two years ago where the banks cannot lend us any more money. We also don't get any support from government. Everything we own is here. This is our whole life. You cannot just pack up a farm and go. You cannot just close your gate. We've got farm workers that have worked for us for decades. How do you just leave and leave them behind? They need to survive. They're part of your family. The hardest gedeelte of the droogte op the stadium is ons, ons wild leven. I had so in total so 250, 300 bokke gehad. I had now 7 uur. All is dood. Die, jy kry nie die wil, die is ouwens wat het recht gekryd om hulle wil te voer, um, maar meeste ouwens kry het nie recht nie. Hulle is net te wild om te kom eet. Ons jachtbedrijf het, het enorm het nou weg. Die ander ouwe hier in die distrik, hy vat ouwens uit ook op jachten. Hy sê by hom het het heel te mal gestop. One of the most difficult things for, for the farmers in the Karoo is to afford the transport cost of fodder because our financial resources are gone. It takes some, something out of you just to see those people in that situation. There's nothing that they, <coughs> that they can do about it. Now, Danny De Waal and Justice Harmse had to now kop by mekaar gesit and begin fondse genereer uh, om, om dit moendlik te maak, want dit is, is dier projekte. Um, en op zo'n so manier het hulle toen nou begin om voer bij elkaar te maken en hulle seisoenstuie, oestuie, het hulle begin kafbale by mekaar maak en dan nou, as hulle sien hulle het genoeg by mekaar om het lompie vrachten te stuur, dan het hulle vervoer gereel, um, trokke gereel. En dan kom die manne met tussen 14 en die meeste denk ek was 26 trokke op een slag, kom hulle met een verschrikkelijke klomvoer hier aan, wat dan nou vir ons as gemeenskap natuurlijk baie beteken. Just getting there and seeing those guys faces when you turn up there with that load of fodder, just seeing how much they appreciate it. Even if it's five buckies or two trucks or twenty or thirty trucks, the expression on their faces is exactly the same. Elke geleentheid wat hulle kom, het hulle altyd vir die vir die ouwe thuis ook iets gebring 
groente, vruchten, toiletpapier, enige, enige iets wat hulle om kan denk breng die manne saam. If it wasn't for them, I don't know what we would have done. It's not only the feed they bring, it's the hope, it's the love, it's the support base you know you've got. We are hopeful that this year, as last year, we every year and every month we're hopeful that they're going to get the rain that they need. But um, until then, we'll keep on giving and delivering as in when possible. And there's still hope for, for every one of us. Bhuti Kirshner is the manager of hunting affairs at SA Hunters and his work involves the diverse aspects of responsible hunting in South Africa. In hunting affairs I mainly deal with um, all hunting related matters because our association is uh, primarily a consumptive hunting association that's where we utilize the, the meat that we hunt for um, own use. We also issue hunting licenses for the different provinces. I deal a lot with the uh, legislation, the draft regulations regarding the game meat. I'm heading the proclamation task team on the Wildlife Forum, which is a forum that uh, directly speaks to government. We're basically in an advisory capacity. Now the Wildlife Forum is a very, very important uh, platform where government at national as well as provincial level is able to meet with the industry. On a quarterly basis, we sit, we look, we reflect, and we see how far we have gone. We look at areas that we have committed ourselves and then be able to, to see how best we move forward. In South Africa, every province issues a hunting proclamation. They look at the weather and the numbers of the animals and then do a hunting proclamation. We also issue hunting licenses for the different provinces. SA Hunters is also a licensed professional hunters association. At this stage we have about 136 members. And then I'm also representing the members on the um, hunting task team of the Wildlife Forum, which is where government is promoting South Africa as a prime hunting destination. We are the premier hunting destination of the world. SA Hunters, in collaboration with Dr. Tertius Berg, compiled a training for our members to inspect the game meat carcass after being hunted to secure that you present your family with acceptable, good quality game meat. You go through a couple of lectures regarding different game diseases and also the livestock diseases. In the practical, uh, animal is basically hunted and then skinned. All the points of indication to a healthy carcass are pointed out, like all the lymph nodes through the body. If our members then want to go on to become game meat examiners, they just do an extension of the course and that will qualify them then to become registered, certified game meat examiners. At the Hunting Affairs, we started a hunt report. We made it fairly easy for our members. You can complete a short summary of your hunt. Online it takes you about two minutes to fill it out. We also give you the option to fill out a complete hunt report. That is, for example, the distance that you travel to the hunting destination, the type of accommodation you used, the staff that aided you during your hunt, for instance, a tracker and a cleaner and a skinner. With that data, we can basically determine what the average amount was spent by each hunter during the season. The data on hunting and the contribution we make into the economics and to job creation and to food security is very important. We started off in 2005 with SA Hunters uh, and the other hunting organizations. It's when we did the first uh, um, economic impact study as we realized we've got no data on, on the economic impact of hunting. The last survey which we conducted was in 2018. We surveyed the international hunter as well as the South African hunter. The international hunter hunt in the vicinity of uh, 1.98 billion rand per year, whereas our South African hunter hunt 11.6 billion per year. So if you add the two together, it's close to 14 billion. When we look at the spending of the hunters, we basically divide them in two categories. One is general spending, which includes accommodation, transportation and food. And then we look at the game hunted. In 2018, the total spending of the SA hunter was close to 60,000 rand per guy per season. 
50% of, of the spending is, is, is the game at the hunt and the other 50% is on the travel um, and, and accommodation spending. International hunters spend per hunter in the vicinity of 240,000 rand per hunt. But again, if you break it down, what they spent here, it is again a 50-50%, but we only receive about 6-7,000 hunters. Now what is quite important is that between 70 and 80% of that income and the contribution is in the rural areas. Three of the provinces that are the most poor in South Africa are the, the prime hunting destinations, which demonstrates that hunting and the wildlife economy can actually really make a contribution in those rural economies and marginalised economies where government often struggle to find opportunities for economic development. At the moment about 70 million hectares are under management of private sector and communities in the wildlife sector. That's about 2.2 times the protected areas in South Africa, which clearly demonstrates that Government alone can't fund the conservation bill in South Africa. We need private sector to make this contribution. But for private sector to make the contribution, they need to have a land use that can generate income. Recent research have shown that about 50% of game ranches in South Africa depend on hunting as one of the income streams. 30% of those depend on hunting as a primary income stream, which demonstrates the importance of hunting as one of those income streams for a viable business model in the wildlife sector. Currently, the legislative framework in South Africa is not necessarily enabling to help private landowners and communities to actually harness the opportunities on their land in a responsible and a sustainable way. That's not often thought about by a hunter. And it's very important because wherever you as a hunter choose to spend your hard-earned revenue, you must remember that, that you are funding that land use. So I think as, a hunter we, as hunters we need to start asking questions about, you know, what does this area I go and hunt in represent towards biodiversity conservation, how do they manage the offtakes, where do they spend their revenue, are they investing it back in the, in the, in the wildlife area. Are they investing in communities and society around there to give people value for wildlife? As a landowner, where it comes to an organization like SI Hunters that has become a mouthpiece for conservation as it should be to keep wild places wild, that supports and pushes for extensive wildlife systems and encourages it in the same within its membership is something that lies very close to my heart. We are in the process of developing SA Hunters approved hunting destination. Those will be hunting properties that comply with the policy statements of SA Hunters who are willing to make packages available to SA Hunter members. The way the system works, I go and I approve the hunting destinations beforehand. They give us a realistic package. For example, on farm X it will be realistic to hunt two impalas and a blue wildebeest or a kudu during a weekend period. So the package is then advertised as such. The hunter pays the money upfront into the account of SA Hunters. After the successful hunt, the landowner sends the invoice to SA Hunters office and we pay the landowner. So the landowner has the security of being paid after the hunt and the hunter has the security of going to a proper destination. The dedicated hunters program is linked to Act 60 of 2000, which also makes it a statutory requirement for hunters that wants to own more than four firearms. It's a skills program and it takes about 15 hours of training. It ends off with a written examination and then it's got a practical component. It's a shooting test. We have a higher level that we expect from a member for his skilled hunter status and that's a more difficult shooting test. We then move on to speciality courses that deals with specific subjects. 
We deal with reloading, we deal with handling and, and working with snakes, we deal with first aid in a hunting environment. There's a, a lot of other courses as well being offered. The latest one that we present deals with dealing with dangerous game animals. We offer this to people that's already done our dedicated hunters training. We've partnered up with the Southern African Wildlife College. So the Southern African Wildlife College was established in 1996 with funds generated through WWFSA and we've grown the institution that started very much with natural resource managers or protected area managers as we discussed in those days and Today we have four different training departments, one that focuses on critical management skills for conservation, one that um, trains community members um, and community governance principles, one that trains responsible resource use principles, and then our fourth and final one is protected area integrity, ranges on the ground, we've even got the aerial, plane, light sports aircraft application and dog units. The college's training approach is applied in all aspects. We like to bridge that gap of theory and practical. So that's our motto, is really about training beyond boundaries in an applied manner. Peter Nell is the senior trainer at the Southern African Wildlife College in the Responsible Resource Use Department. The focus is to deliver advanced skills in the various conservation fields through supplementary education and training. Our involvement with SA Hunters started 2014. By the end of 2015, we had a pilot course in Dangerous Game. And then in 2016, we had our first month fully booked of back-to-back -back courses in Elephant and Buffalo. Since then, we've trained in excess of 200 members of SA Hunters and Game Conservation Association. One of my first exposures to dangerous game was through the Wildlife College, through a course organized through the SA Hunters organization, where we get an exposure to dangerous animals on foot. Pitnal, he will get you within 10 paces of a wild African elephant bull. And it's, it's an experience, like even just thinking about it now, your heart still beats in your throat. You can't attach a price to that kind of experience. And like I will forever be indebted to SO Hunters. And the lessons that I learned there, I get to apply every single day if I've, when I'm taking out clients. Doesn't matter what it is, if we're going after Impala or a buffalo, whatever the case may be. That's where the character comes from. That is what makes a beautiful buffalo is all that wear and tear. We are developing and have had a lot of input from SA Hunters Game Conservation Association in the design and the material for a new module specifically on responsible resource use that broadens the whole field. It doesn't just look at wildlife, it looks at resources in general and, and, that it, that, and, and it's the conservation and usage of those. The principle behind that being that if it's usable, if you can put a value to it, then it can be conserved. People will look after it. If wildlife doesn't work for the people of that area and is of no value to them, the people will then decide, well, how can we generate benefits? So they will probably just eat the wildlife once they finished with that, cut down the bush, turn it into a form of agriculture, maybe run their livestock. I think ultimately that's not a win for anyone. More and more these days we are starting to understand what is known as regenerative science, so the regenerative management of the planet. So if your management principles are not sustaining life cycles, water cycles, things like that, you're out of line. We're looking at conservation from ecological sustainability, economic sustainability and then social sustainability. Now all three aspects of that conservation are equally as important. So sustainable principles of off-takes is very important. Are you generating the right revenue from your wildlife resource, what it's actually worth, and where's that revenue being spent? So as long as it's going back into sustaining the systems, the societies around it, and adding value, and that in essence is basically what we would call growing the wildlife economy. Conservation has been a key objective of SA Hunters since its inception in 1949 and the association has evolved into a locally and internationally respected organization that supports an integrated and rational approach to conservation. It is recognized within the wildlife sector for its thought leadership in responsible wildlife management and the scientific community for contributing to applied research, innovation and knowledge transfer. 
Acknowledging human dependency on functioning ecosystems and its role as a cornerstone for sustainable economic growth and rural development is critical. The key focus is securing wildlife habitats and associated biodiversity and promoting responsible wildlife utilization based on economic efficiency, social responsibility and ecological sustainability principles. Wildlife as a land use must be able to compete economically with other forms of land use or it will disappear. Hunting is an essential contributor to this and helps fund private conservation initiatives. But its future is dependent on demonstrating how it contributes to conservation, food security, human well-being and socio-economic development. We are one of the few, if not the only, hunting organisation that do have a permanent position um, and a, an employed personnel for conservation, which I think demonstrates the commitment of the organisation towards conservation. This is not just something that is being done as an afterthought, and it's not only focused on the species that are being hunted. Conservation is an integral part of the objectives and the work of ESA hunters. We've, through the years, become part of various national and international conservation initiatives. We're a member of the IUCN, which would not have been possible if we didn't have demonstrable conservation projects. We've also been invited by many of the conservation agencies and NGOs to participate with them on international forums. My office, the Conservation Office, is represented in the National Line Working Group. We sit on the National Vulture Task Force. We're also involved in the National Wildlife Poison Prevention Working Group and the Lead Task Team. We sit on the SICAD working group and recently we've also been invited to participate in the development of a national response strategy for the succulents in South Africa. This is one of the areas that receives so little attention in South Africa but out there it's a nightmare at the moment. We've got a couple of landowners in the Makboland area and they felt very frustrated that they have this continuous onslaught of poaching on their properties and they don't really have a lot of support from government or anybody else. So ESA hunters decided to start this Save Our Succulents and now we have landowners in that area that all became part of the initiative and what the landowners um, pledge as part of this whole initiative is that they will conserve the succulents on their properties and that they will become part of this whole initiative to deal with poaching. We're putting up big signboards now along some of the routes with a helpline which ESA hunters will man. Having members in ESA hunters that are here for conservation, we have landowners, we have hunters, and then we also have firearms and sport shooting. But because we have such a diverse member base, we really have to keep our finger on the pulse of what is happening in an array of legislative processes in South Africa. In particular, as far as conservation is concerned, hunting in South Africa is regulated through the conservation legislation. And conservation in South Africa is a concurrent competence, which means that there's national legislation, but each of the nine provinces also have their own legislation in terms of conservation, which make it quite tricky for, a, for an organisation like ESA Hunters to keep track of changes in legislation, what is happening, and we have to give inputs in all of these legislative processes. Then, in addition, there's the Department of Agriculture that also have an impact on the activities of members of ESA Hunters through things like meat regulations and so on. So that is one of the core areas that we in ESA Hunters focus on, is to make sure that the interests of our members are represented in all of these legislative processes. Growing the wildlife economy is a centerpiece of SA Hunters conservation strategy, and the organization is involved in a variety of projects across the country. SA Hunters member from the Umfalosi branch, Nico Harris, is a partner in Frins Cup Farming Enterprises in northern KwaZulu-Natal. Several years ago, 
NICO and the Regional Farmers Association initiated a land reform project involving the local communities. So we started an initiative in ending funds through members of the Farmers Association to fund the project and we identified about 8,000 hectares which has got game and cattle land as well as timber and sugarcane land on it. We got hold of government and said yeah, some willing sellers and where the government would buy it and that we were willing to do a joint venture with the community to assist them to get this project off the ground. Our beneficiaries are plus or minus 950 those people who owns those four farms. We are partnering with Frenska Budari who introduced us to SA Hunters as well. On our farms we have timber, we have sugarcane, we have game, we have Nguni head. I head the conservation planning division which deals with a number of um, components of, of conservation but in this context, protected area expansion. Mainly expansion of our protected areas into communal areas where we try and form a partnership with them. And it started round about 2014, 2015. And that was round about the time that I met with people at um, Essa Hunters and Game Conservation who were also looking for pretty much the same idea. If we want to really consider sustainability and conservation, we can't do that without considering the socio-economic landscape around the areas that we want to conserve. Through this partnership with SA Hunters, we were able to engage with communities much more effectively because their members were part of those communities. The game farm that the Kwasanguya community got donated by government had a hunting farm on it. What we did, and it was an initiative of my son, he designed a, a system whereby he said, let's have six hunting packages a year. The hunter is allowed to bring a group of eight people. For more than six to eight years, we've had six groups coming. And the most of them are SA Hunters members. And they're also feeling that's their way of contributing to this whole project. The Kwasanguya community has got land that is bordering Upati Nature Reserve. Which is approximately a eight or 9,000 hectare reserve under the control of Izimvelo. We developed a, a business plan that we submitted to Izimvelo to see how the community, together with private sector support from Friendscop and support from SA Hunters and Game Conservation Association, how they can collaborate with Izimvelo in managing a much larger area than Upati. Government has to conserve representative samples of its biodiversity and its natural landscapes throughout the country. So the one model is, which was the historic model, was government to buy land and create state protected areas. How a government doesn't have that kind of money and why should we be taking land away from people and conserving it to the benefit of those people? For me, it doesn't make sense. We will also open job, open job opportunities for everyone in this community. There's opportunities for tourism, there's opportunities for hunting, which already takes place on their land, and they can share resources. People living next to these protected areas, once they start seeing these economic benefits from the wildlife sector, the attitudes towards these protected areas change over time. This is actually an opportunity where you can achieve conservation objectives as well as socio-economic development objectives by partnering private sector, communities and government. So we have worked very well with SA Hunters on a number of areas and one central example is the developmental nodes and we put a pilot one in KwaZulu-Natal. The Mfolozi nodes is a case in point where SA Hunters is at the centre of it. Kwasanguya was one of the initial anchor projects for the Mfolozi Biodiversity Economy node but we've also identified other community initiatives in the area. With a partnership with SA Hunters and effectively them taking the lead on this, accelerated delivery much faster than I had imagined. I think SA Hunters has played a very good role model to other agencies who are in the conservation industry that it's actually quite an easy step to take to enter in these partnerships and grow the conservation industry. 
And I think it's very naive of anyone to think, well, we'll leave that to government to do themselves. We've shown that might not be a safe bet. The safe bet is government in partnership with organizations like SA Hunters to get these initiatives off the ground in a very short time. And if you follow that model, I think conservation has a very bright future in this country. The approach to conservation within ESA Hunters is that some of our initiatives, the, some of the strategic initiatives are managed and coordinated from head office, um, where branches are not necessarily always involved in some of those initiatives. But it's also critically important that we demonstrate the conservation culture in the organisation through the initiatives at branch level. We've developed a system where all of the branches register their conservation initiatives and then from head office side we look at those initiatives and we help them formulate those initiatives in such a way that we can really demonstrate that we do have a positive conservation contribution through those initiatives. Vroeger jare het ons die kraan vol projek ondersteun, dit het bietjie van achterwee geblei en ons het later jare besluit om deel te raak, of nie deel te raak nie, om ons aasvoelrestaurant wat al baie jare in die dorp is, te vat en te ondersteun. Ons hele aasvoelrestaurant projek kom nou wel een klomp jare saam. Die gemeenskap het een groot rol daan, ons kry baie karkasse van die gemeenskap af. Die aasvoelrestaurant bestaan nou al jare hier so en dit is ook op die trekroute van die aasvoel, sê vanaf is hulle Track. Die Asvo restaurant is op hulle GPS ingestel, so hulle weet hulle kry hulle kos hier so, badfaciliteite, waterdamme is hier so, so hulle geniet het hier so. En op een stadium het ons by een gedachte gekom om meer werk in die Asvo restaurant in te sit en dan monitering te doen van die Asvo's. So one of the main reasons why Volpro exists is to protect and preserve the species because they are declining at an incredibly rapid rate, with some species having declined by over 97%. Why do we need to protect vultures? They are nature's garbage cleanup crew, where they help prevent the spread of diseases, which is hugely important. Major threats and what we deal with mostly here at Volpro is power line incidents, being both electrocutions and collisions. Poisoning is the biggest threat for vultures in Africa, where farmers and landowners are trying to get rid of what they perceive as, as problem animals, and they lace carcasses and vultures find those carcasses before your targeted animal, and they then in turn get poisoned. A muti trade is a big issue. Now whether you want to call it muti trade or traditional medicine or belief based use. It's all pretty much the same thing. The theory is vultures are clairvoyant. People believe they can see into the future and so they're used for gambling and horse racing and, and the likes. Vulture restaurants are incredibly important. They address the threat of a lack of safe, reliable and sufficient food. The Lichtenberg Vulture Restaurant does all of that. In addition, it does something much more important. It brings the SA Hunters Association and its members directly involved with the conservation of the species. Niels always gereel that our carcass is as ons die kinders uitbring. So as ons in die huid inklim, kon hulle elke kind kon sien hoe elke aasvoel werk. En hoe kom my aasvoel nie van sy pin van sy bek af tot hy op sy boors veer het nie. Want sy kop indruk om vleis te vreet en goed is dat dit makkeliker kan spoon kom. Ons het ook vreselik baie waterdamme in die wildheelcentrum waar ons dan nou die junior kies heen vat om te gaan sien ook hoe die natuur lewe om die water areas is. These people do this without getting paid. It's something that they do in their own free time and it's amazing to see what the contribution is. The Essa Hunters Association is the first organization that is not a formal conservation organization that participates in the National Vulture Working Group for South Africa, as well as the National Task Force Group, which actively participates in looking at responsible measures to save vulture species. For a member organization, it definitely highlights lights the way forward in which other like-minded organizations should be following suit. The Namakwa branch of SA Hunters, formed in 2018, is one of the organization's newest. Carl Oberholzer is the chairman and is determined to make the branch a success. 
because we are the youngest brands, we like to perform. Hunting and conservation walks hand in hand. And to be able to continue to hunt, one have to get involved in the conservation part of our game. And we've got nice initiatives where we support our local parks. So one of them being Rustersveld, where we are at the moment, and then Gugab closer to Springbok. The Namakuland region, and especially Gugab, is known for its annual wildflower displays. You cannot believe that a area which is a rocky desert for the rest of the year, for three months of the year, is this absolute painting of colour. Gugab Nature Reserve was established in the 1960s. It was initiated by the Kip Copper Mining Company. A mine actually donated land to conservation. The original property size was 4,000 hectares and it was declared as a protected area in 1966. Over the course of the years, we've been able to procure additional tracts of land. Currently, the reserve encompasses approximately 33,000 hectares now. And hopefully, in future, we'll be able to expand on this. Through expanding the property, we have been able to procure sites where highly endemic species occur. Currently the reserve have approximately 660 odd species of succulents, of which a very large number are endangered and protected. Unfortunately, because of the high biodiversity value that we have, the area is a hotspot for illegal activities. Large numbers of plants and reptiles are illegally collected and poached. It's a huge, huge impact uh, financial-wise for Namakwa because you get a lot of foreigners coming to Namakwa land area to uh, come and spend thousands of rand to see the beautiful fauna and flora of Namakwa land area. The protection of these areas are paramount and we cannot do it alone. We need partners. So if the poachers take over and SA hunters don't get involved, then the foreigners won't visit. And last year we've got a meeting between nature conservation officers, the police. We discussed how can SA hunters get involved in conservation in the Makwa land. During 2019, they donated biodiversity monitoring equipment, including wildlife tracking cameras, PDAs, which we use for our monitoring, and binoculars. That assists us greatly because immediately it allows us more feet on the ground to assist with the monitoring, to assist with the policing of the area. So the Richtersfeld National Park forms part of the II's Richtersfeld Transfrontier Park and this is a transfrontier park with Namibia and that is the II's Hot Springs Game Park. The Transfrontier Park was established for a number of reasons, not just conservation but especially for the cultural aspects. We do joint operations on numerous aspects with Namibia, so we have joint tourism opportunities. We do joint law enforcement patrols where we do active patrols on the Orange River and anti-poaching operations. The southern southeastern border of the park is the Richtersfeld World Heritage Site. So the park is very fortunate to have assistance from SA Hunters and Game Conservation Association, wherein they have helped immensely with regards to law enforcement and the establishment of certain facilities in the Richtersfeld National Park's nursery. Our hoofdoel eindelijk vir die kwekerij is om die replante te bewaar vir die nageslag, so dat dit nie, dat dit nie verloor wat gaan nie. So we're standing in the Konefaitum Conservancy or Konefaitum House as we call it. This is a dream that's been made possible by the SA Hunters and Game Conservation Association for which we are very thankful. There are no one that's providing the world with the species by propagating the species and through a legal process making them available. But we also need to build up a gene bank for the genus because the poaching is at the extent at the moment that in the nearby future it's very highly likely that some species are going to go extinct. First it started with the Asian people coming themselves to poach and then when they were caught too much they started paying um, locals. The problem is just the demand is growing because of Facebook and Instagram. So it's being shared on Facebook pages like um, South African succulents or world succulents and there's um, 100 or 200 or even up to half million people on the page. And they see this and conophytums are very beautiful and attractive, especially when in flower. And because of the huge diversity that you get within them and variation, it's a fantastic species to build up as a collection. But the problem is they are so incredibly localized endemic.
There's a species in southern Richtersfeld that the, the total population is a thousand plants and half of that plants were removed by poaching. It's very highly likely that that species at the moment is extinct. It's potentially our first species that we lost now through poaching. Another thing that's important of having this gardens and having a conservancy in house like this is for education for the local community. And at the moment the local community due to poverty are highly targeted by the people from overseas that wants these plants and offered money to do the poaching. This is a gemeenskapskwekerij en dit is deel van die parkse uh, bestuursplan maar dit is a gemeenskapskwekerij en as mense voel kan hulle kom en kom inlichting kry. And it's also fantastic to have this facility because by growing species side by side for scientific research, it's a wonderful opportunity to get scientists, um, taxonomists to come in and do more in-depth studies on a genus like Gonophytum. And we're looking forward for continuous joint operation and cooperation with um, SA hunters. At both national and branch levels, SA Hunter's Snare Busters initiative focuses on collaboration with other conservation partners to address the ever-increasing wildlife poaching problem. Association members volunteer their time and resources to anti-poaching patrols, taking out snares, and with veterinarian support, rescuing live animals still caught in them and treating animals with snare-related wounds. Over a two-year period, the Umfalosi and Mopani branches patrolled over 600 kilometers on foot, discovered 25 poaching camps, removed more than 2,000 snares, and released many animals caught in snares. SA Hunters has donated over 300,000 rand for the RODIS program, which creates DNA profiles of rhino horns to assist in the prosecution of poachers. The association also contributes to the national rhino conservation and anti-poaching strategies. The Norman Dean Farming District in the KwaZulu-Natal province lies in the foothills of the Dragonsberg mountain range. The primary crops grown in the region are maize, wheat and soy, but the most significant percentage of the land is under cattle. Martins Pojita is a maize farmer who came to the area as a child in 1970. A passionate conservationist, he is always looking for a balance between growing crops and the environment's health. In 2011, the Umpongini branch of SA Hunters was formed, with Martins as the first chairman. From a nucleus of 80 people, the membership numbers have grown to nearly 300. And in 2000 het ek by Parkerraad aangesluit as erebeamte en toe het ek begin deelneem aan aktiviteite rondom die Parkerraad in die gebied. Daar het het ek achtergekom hoeveel oorbiekies daar eindelijk in die hele gebied is. En rondom die oorbiekies en toe met die koedoes wat begin het in die area en die rietbokke en die vlakvarke, toe het ons begin sien dat daar een probleem gaan kom met die hoeveelheid wild rondom onwette gejaag met honde taxiaans. Omdat ik bij Parker had ge gehelp het en gewerkt het aan projecten, het ik toe uh, in 2000 het ek met die mensen in die gebied begin praat en toe registreer ik een bewaringsgebied bij name die uh, Mpungini bewaringsgebied. Kom ik sê, die gebied is 75.000 hectare bewaringsgebied wat ons in 2002 geregistreerd het, daar is so plus minus 62 lede wat in die gebied actief boer. I know in the beginning a lot of farmers were very worried that they were going to be told what to do on their farms and it's not been like that at all. We've just had so much help when it comes to illegal hunting in our area. I've myself had an incident about five or six years ago where one Sunday morning um, we got guys coming in to come and hunt on our farms. That specific day we managed to catch, it was about 37 dogs um, that had caught game already. And I think it was just so much easier to be able to get them convicted being in a conservancy. Die politie, die parkeraad, allemaal het die hand bijgezet en, en ons het die gebied veilig gemaakt vir, vir die dieren hier rond, vir al die oorbiekies. We ride against the escarpment with the Free State Border so we've got high mountains, it just makes it really just impossible to be able to fence everything closed. But I don't think there's any gain in, 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 in 
fencing it closed because uh, the game's still coming freely into our area. There's nothing that we really want to keep out of our area. So if there's any game willing to come in further, we are just there to be able to conserve it. There is a day when the kudus begin to feel what commercial cyber is. Is that by a scare that come around them the kudus? Om ja, ons 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 het 'n groot hoeveelheid bokke. So die lekker manier om hulle te kan hanteer is om permitte te kry en dan van hulle te jaag in die omgewing. Ongelukkig reik die overhede nie permitte uit vir 'n bewaringsgebied nie. Hulle reik net permitte uit aan die verdeelde grond eienaars. En elke eienaar kan dan aansoek doen vir 'n permit. Ons het oor hier gekom. Ek gaan dan en ek gaan jaag. Ek bring jaagters in. Hy skiet sy bok, hy vat om, hy gaan. Ons vat die geld, ons sit die ploege terug in die gebied in, in sekuriteit, rondom vandagse tyd, is sekuriteit een probleem. Die vraag is, wat het sy voordeel het ons al uitgekry uit die bewaringsgebied uit. Hy nou oil en gas ingekom in die gebied en wou begin fracking doen vir gas en toe daar weer een maatskapie ingekom wat wil kom boor vir steenkool en hulle wil sand uithaal. Die bewaringsgebied maak ons hand net sterker, ons het hulle gestop. Tot dit sverre was het een groot sukses gewees. SA Hunters initiated the Water for Life project to create awareness about the integrity of South African freshwater resources and the importance of water management in the catchment areas. The Garden Root Branch in the Eastern Cape conducted the pilot project with a group of children from the town of George who were introduced to the Minisas River Monitoring Method. The impact of land use practices in catchment areas on water quality was explained to the children and how the presence or lack of certain insects indicates the river water quality. Once this project is fully operational, participants from different branches will be able to exchange information and learn about the various river systems throughout the country. It will provide opportunities to get kids into the outdoors and involved in activities that contribute to conservation. Because the membership of ESA Hunters is distributed throughout South Africa, we have the unique opportunity for members to actually participate in citizen science and help collect data on species that are rare and that we don't know a lot about. So ESA Hunters developed an app that members can now use on their cell phones when they're out in the field and they can start collecting data of an array of species Things like pangolins, vulture information, project Groot Oog on the owls, the data are now captured on this app. And with regular intervals, the data will then be downloaded and sent to specific conservation agencies that work on those species. This way, we believe that we can really also make a contribution to conservation other than the specific conservation projects that we run within the organisation. And we're today here on this beautiful reserve called Rietvlei Nature Reserve in Pretoria. Very special place for us. It falls within our branch boundary and we decided many years ago to get involved in Rietvlei and make Rietvlei part of, of our conservation fund. We're standing here in front of this magnificent boma built in 2011 to assist Rietvlei in managing their game numbers to bring in and take animals off the reserve. When rhino poaching just started uh, getting out of hand. We assisted here with some thermal cameras. We also had made a vehicle available here to assist in the security of the reserve. As things developed here at Reflay, we decided to introduce Cheetah in collaboration with uh, the EWT, that is the Endangered Wildlife Trust. We decided to, to introduce Cheetah back onto Reflay, a breeding pair, male and female. Incredible how numbers of people visiting the reserve increased. And yeah, when we had little baby cup cheetahs, the gate numbers just skyrocketed. Then another project is a bee and a honey producing project that we do had. We've got 15 hives with the Gauteng Beehive Association. And that's also a very a good project for us as, as bees are on, under great threat. As everybody knows that bees are very important in sustaining nature. So uh, the bee project made sense for us and we gave 15 hives to, to Gauteng. We've already produced our first honey there. 
and remarketing that honey uh, under our logo in conjunction with the Gauteng Beekeepers Association. And we've also got 50 nights with the Waterberg Beekeepers Association. So yeah, we, we're very proud of that project going well as well. The Gauteng Biodiversity Stewardship Program is very, very excited about our collaboration with SA Hunters, specifically the Springbuck Branch. And the Devon Protected Environment is very important to us in Gauteng in terms of nature conservation because of all the threatened species that find refuge in these beautiful grasslands. The Devon Protected Environment consists of seven di different landowners. It totals just of under 8,000 hectares of which about 5,000 hectares is natural grasslands. The biodiversity stewardship mechanism gives us a platform by which we in can engage private or communal landowners to work with them hand in hand to conserve the natural grasslands and to promote sustainable resource management. Now the grasslands biome is under severe pressure from development, agriculture, mining, but where we're standing today, we're very proud for the relationship that we've established with the landowners here. We are very excited about the partnership with SA Hunters, specifically the Springbok branch, because they are already active in the landscape and they can immensely assist the Gauteng Biodiversity Stewardship Program. Gauteng uh, Natuurbewaring het een aantal praatje gehou daar by ons tak. En ons het het baie interessant gevind en besluit Ons wil ook ondersteuning gee in hierdie project. Ons is reeds in die omgeving met ons eile bewaring project, wat ons doen in Devon area. So ons het besluit, dit sal een goeie initiatief van ons wees, om hier ondersteuning te gee. Ons het financiële ondersteuning gegeven met die boorde, soos jy hier kan sien. Ons is ook actief bezig met die bankrotbosie, wat ons wil help uitroe in hierdie omgeving. En vir ons tak is dit eindelijk een voorrecht en een baie waardevolle om die mensen hier te kan kom help. So one of the longest running initiatives in SA Hunters was where our members actually started putting up owl boxes because they wanted to contribute to the conservation of owls. The Springbok branch was one of the initial branches that really focused on owl conservation. So our initial owl box from donated wood, even the nails we started building according to spec which, that we draw off the, the internet started building these old cases. They last for about a year, year and a half, and then we had to replace them. And then realized it's not worth the effort. We need to do something different. So one of our senior members in the Exco then um, got an idea to start building a box that you can actually put together with four or six screws and it interlinks like a puzzle and you can ship it quite easily. One of the challenges was, however, that we didn't have any feedback on whether those boxes were successful for our conservation. So a couple of years ago, we decided that we're going to structure the project a bit better. Right now, the boxes are numbered. The geolocations are recorded where they are positioned. They're positioned in specific directions. A specific height it needs to be put up. It's got to be enclosed. There's got to be trees and branches around it with a little passage to get in. And for each box, there's a monitoring program that we capture the data so that we can determine which of the owl boxes that we put up are actually successful in assisting in breeding for the owls and that we can capture the data. We've spent a lot of time of structuring the project in such a way that we can roll it out to the rest of the country. And hopefully in time we will have a program that runs throughout the country where we can collect data because there's no sense in putting up owl boxes and we don't know whether they are actually successful in contributing to the conservation of owls. For us to really have success in terms of owl conservation, we have to collaborate with landowners. And one of the future steps as part of our owl conservation initiative is to actually develop a small guideline that we can provide to landowners that can help them in the management of these pockets of natural habitat that occur between the areas where they plant maize or soya beans. It's important to understand that we need these areas where we produce food for the country. So we have to work with these landowners to see how we can adapt management practices in this specific case, they don't burn this area anymore and they don't slash the grass because they know that those owls are breeding here. So if we can get other landowners to participate in an owl conservation program, we might see successes in terms of the owls. My supervisor for my honours research was approached by uh, SA Hunters to have a look at the effectiveness of the owl restaurants that were set up by the Springbok branch in order to protect uh, the, the owls in the area. 
What we did find is that it doesn't appear to be that the food availability for these birds, specifically the rodents, seems to be affecting their abundance in the area. This is a, in a critically endangered ecosystem, the Busman Sprayt highfowl grassland. And this is where these birds are nesting, where they're foraging, where they're breeding. So this habitat seems to be very important to them, um, you know, for their survival. And specifically we found water sources was very important, which correlates with the marsh and the grass owl, which both nest near water. And so we think that the reason that they are so abundant in the area is because of these water sources and the ecosystem as opposed to the food. So that gave us a better understanding of the owls, the ecology around them. Um, I think to the extent where we've realized eight or nine years later that we have funded this project of the owl conservation program for the Springbok branch in, in terms of well over one million rand. So this has made us realize we're not just a hunter but we're also conservationist. From its humble beginnings in 1949, when 50 hunters met in a coffee shop in a zoo, when there seemed no hope for the future of wildlife in South Africa, SA Hunters and Game Conservation Association has grown into the largest member-based hunting and conservation organization in Africa. It strives to serve the interests of hunters, sport shooters and game ranchers by defending the rights of firearm owners, cultivating a culture of responsible hunting and firearm ownership, establishing viable shooting, hunting and conservation activities, bridging the divide between academics, politicians and wildlife custodians, strengthening partnerships with allies, presenting a unified voice, encouraging community support projects, ensuring civic integration, endorsing an integrated, sensible approach to biodiversity conservation, funding and conducting applied research, undertaking demonstrable conservation projects, supporting anti-poaching programs, promoting responsible wildlife management, partnering with rural communities and new entrants to ensure inclusive growth of the wildlife sector, repositioning the wildlife economy as a viable land use option, investing in youth programs to safeguard the legacy, reinforcing a positive public image of hunters and hunting. SA Hunters is an association that gives true meaning to the words citizen and hunter.